Hey folks, welcome to week four of DMD 105, Digital Design Foundations. How is everybody? Hope you're doing good. Getting used to working in Photoshop. By now you guys are becoming pros, or at least getting super comfortable doing it. So this is good. All right, so this week we are going to move into a new topic that is not only germane to Photoshop, but also germane to visual design in general. Uh, so we said at the beginning of the semester that this class was not going to only be about learning software, but about learning certain elements of design that are specific to design as a whole outside of the software. And so this is one of those weeks where we're going to introduce a new topic, specifically color management, which is not only important to Photoshop, but important in a very bunch of other areas in the world of visual design. Okay, so what we're going to do on this video lecture is we're going to start diving into color theory uh, as a general design concept, talk a little bit about the history of color theory, where it came from, how it is employed in the world of art and design, uh, talk a little bit about some of the color tools in Photoshop, uh, and also just uh, a brief overview of color theory as a general concept, okay? Then when we meet in person this week, uh, we are gonna get into Photoshop specifically and really work with those color tools that I'll introduce you to now, uh, and you can sort of play around with them and get used to using color in Photoshop, and we'll talk about exporting color, color formats, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're gonna look at these three handouts in a moment, right? The CMYK RGB comparison PDF, uh, the color models PDF and the understanding web colors PDF. So we'll go through those in a moment. Your consumable for the week, your textbook reading is going to be to watch this video here, which is a very brief overview about color theory in general. So watch that, it's a great video, it's very short. So it'll give you a bit of an overview about color. Uh, also this week, in terms of things you have to do, we have our second quiz, the basics of selections and masks. Now we've spent the last couple of weeks working with marquee tools, lasso tools, polygonal lasso tools, making all sorts of selections, making masks, cutting things out, uh, and so now you're going to take a quiz on that. And like the previous quiz, this is a multi-step uh, exercise that is meant to be timed uh, and you can sort of do that on your own feel free to do it over and over again as many times as you want until you are comfortable with it until you feel as though you are working as quickly through it as possible set your timer for 20 minutes I expect you to do this on the honor system uh, and then of course upload your results to the quiz to section of assignments okay so practice with that that'll be great it's cer certainly important okay also due this week we started our first project uh, a couple weeks ago our uh, crime noir poster right that is due at the end of this week project one the retro movie poster for crime noir uh, so make sure that you are uploading your draft for that so the final is not due this week the draft sorry i meant to say draft don't panic. So you are going to upload a draft of it this week in the Project One section so that we can give you some feedback on it, right? So that you can get a little bit uh, of a critique and then you can go ahead and for homework, you're going to finish it, okay? So you're going to continue it for homework. So the final is not due this week, just the draft. So get that uploaded. And a draft, of course, is just sort of where you are now with it. Show us how far along you are and we'll give you some feedback. Things you can change, things you can make better, and we'll tell you how wonderful it is, okay? All right, great. Let's take a look at color management, color theory, and a little bit about the history of color by diving into these three handouts. Um, before you go ahead and watch the rest of this video, you probably want to watch this video that will give you a very quick overview of color theory. So go ahead, watch that. I'll wait. Okay, hey, you're back. All right, great. Let's take a look at these handouts. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about color theory. Now, I say a little bit about color theory because, frankly, color theory as an art and design concept is huge. In fact, if you go to uh, Amazon and just search color theory in their book section, you are going to find thousands and thousands of color theory books. There's a ton of them out there. You can take color theory classes in school. You can take them online. In fact, if you were going to school to get your Bachelor of Fine Arts in some kind of art or design major, you probably would take one or two full color theory classes. You'd be doing 16 to 32 weeks of just color theory. So what I'm trying to say here is there's a lot to learn about color. We're clearly not going to get through all of it in a week. But I do want to introduce you to some of the major concepts, the history of it, why we uh, developed color theory as a society, how it plays into the world of design and specifically web design, right? And then we'll look at some of the color theory tools and the color application tools in Photoshop. And like I say, in person, we're going to work with them, okay? 
All right, so let's start right here. So this here talks about the concept of color models, okay? Now, what's a color model? All a color model is, it's a visual theory based on a hypothesis for how the human eye sees color. Now, the human eye, like a lot of human physiology, is kind of an amazing thing, and people have been studying it for hundreds of years, right? And one of the things that a lot of people looked into is how is it that we actually see color? Because one of the theories is that objects in real life don't actually have any color attached to them. Or more specifically, the colors that we see when we look at a flower, or you look at the sky, or you look at the ocean, or you look at a plant or anything like that, or you look at an animal, those colors that you see are entirely interpretive, meaning that your brain, through your eyeballs, sees them a particular way. And other people's brains and other people's eyeballs see them a different way. Now, we know this is true in actual practical terms because have you ever tried to pick out paint colors with a friend or somebody you live with? Go to Home Depot, try to pick out paint colors for your living room and let me know how well that goes. If an argument does not break out, then you're doing it wrong. What I mean is that we don't see color the same, time, the same way, right? You might pull out a paint swatch and say, oh, this is kind of a blue-green, I like it. And then your friend might look at it and say, no, it's kind of a green-blue. I don't think it's a blue-green. You're close. You're in the ballpark. But one person sees it a little bit different than somebody else, right? And so part of that is because the way color works in our brain is that the mechanics of your eyeball translates light that comes into your eyeballs from the outside, bounces off the back of your eye, translates that into information which is fed to a part of your brain which sees it as a certain type of color. Now this of course discounts the entire idea of naming colors. We all collectively as a society over history have decided that certain things are called red or blue or yellow and we all sort of agree on it and yet we don't all see that same shade of color exactly the same, right? It's a little different from person to person. And so without getting too much into the psychology of color, this is what drove a lot of early uh, researchers and experimenters to try to figure out how do humans actually see color? And furthermore, how do we create color? So the earliest documented attempts at these color models date back to the 15th century, right? Back to the 1400s. And so color theory principles first appeared in the writings of Leon Battista Alberti around 1435 and in the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci, who I'm sure you've heard of. Leonardo da Vinci did a whole lot of everything, right? And this was around 1490 in his notebook. So somewhere in the, in the early to late 1400s, uh, people who were interested in such things started writing about the idea of color theory and created color models. Now, of course, the term color theory didn't really exist at the time, but we retroactively look back at what they did with their work and we consider it early color theory, but they weren't calling it color theory. They were just trying to figure out how the human eye saw colors and how you could create colors colors, right? Now, they didn't really build a color model back then. Um, it had to jump ahead a couple of hundred years before people started building color models, but ba uh, Battista, Alberti, and da Vinci were at least thinking about it. They were at least writing about it and wondering about it. Okay, so let's jump ahead from the 15th century to the 18th century. So now we're up to the 1700s. So it took a few hundred years, but in the 18th century, we have the first documented color model, which is the RYB model, the red, yellow, blue model, which you can see right over here in the upper right corner. So this is a historical set of subtractive primary colors. Now you're going to see that term a lot. There are subtractive color models and there are additive color models. Subtractive color models, when they are overlapped with each other in equal amounts, will basically end up in, they subtract the colors, hence the name, and end up in something resembling what we recognize as black. Additive color models, when you overlap the, the various colors in equal amounts, they add up to become what we now see as white, or clear even. So uh, the RYB color model is a subtractive color model. It is primarily used in art and design education, uh, particularly painting. It predates most modern scientific color theory. Um, and so you see a lot of this used in early painting techniques, even teaching children about colors. In fact, if you look at this early color model at RYB, you will probably recognize some of the things you were taught in kindergarten, right? Blue and yellow makes green. 
Red and yellow makes orange. Red and blue makes purple. You remember this, right, from kindergarten? So these basic ideas were that if you take these three primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, you can mix them together in a variety of percentages to get every other possible color. Now, the truth of the matter is that the RYB color model had some shortcomings to it. You really can't make every color that we can see, but you can make a lot of colors. And like I said, it provides the basis for basic color theory that we all learned as children and that is even still used today, even though we have more advanced color theories to rely on. Okay, so from the 18th century, we jump ahead 100 years to the 19th century. So now we're really in sort of modern history, right? So in the 19th century, uh, you can see that, well, more modern history, I should say. Um, there are two major color theories, what we consider modern color theories, that came into being. And before we learn a little bit about them, I will give you a preview and say that we still use these color theories today. So what was developed in the 19th century stuck around. They were so well developed and so good that we still use them today in practice, both in non-digital and digital environments. Okay, so the first one is the RGB color model, which you might have heard of, and RGB stands for red, green, blue. It is an additive color model, which means, again, if you put all the colors together, it ends up in white, right? So this is RGB. Uh, and so this is when red, green, and blue lights are added together in various ways to produce a broad array of colors. Now, the reason why it's important that these are from lights is that the earlier color models, like RYB, were dealing with paints, right? And so it was a physical way of mixing color. But of course, that's not how your eyeball works. That's not how your brain works. Your eyeball and your brain is translating what it sees from light. And so this color model, RGB, was a huge step forward in understanding how human beings see color. And not just human beings, of course, other animals see color as well. Um, although not exactly the same way we do. Now, of course, there are what they call cones in your eyes that translate light into these various colors and break it down into red, green, and blue in various percentages of each. And similar to the RYB color model, when you overlap certain ones, you get some, some obvious color choices. But if you mix them in different percentages, you can get millions of colors, which is much closer to how the human eye sees than what they were trying to figure out earlier on in history. Now, the RYB color model, again, was an attempt to explain how the human eyeball sees things, but now is used for areas where we use light to display color, like the computer screen you're looking at right now, or your television set, or projectors, or anything where light becomes uh, comes into being by the use of color. So, of course, the main purpose of RGB uh, color model is for sensing representation and display of images now in electronic systems like I said televisions computers and so on and so forth it's also used in conventional photography you know before electronics came along before we had computers uh, RGB already had a very solid color theory behind it in its interpretation of how human perception worked and so it was a natural translation over to the digital technology that we use today so this is where RGB is now used these days the other color model that was developed in the same century, in the, in the 19th century, was the CMYK color model. Now, CMYK stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Now, this color model is a subtractive color model. So, again, when you overlap the colors, it becomes a version of black. I say a version of black because true jet black uh, doesn't really exist when you overlap actual colors. Instead, you get some kind of dark, sludgy color. And so you'll notice that black is an actual color here, and you'll notice it's not mentioned anywhere else. Um, and that's because CMYK uh, is what you call a process for color system that eventually became used in printing publications, whether we were printing T-shirts or books or posters or whatever. Um, this color model, CMYK, uh, was used in printing and so if you needed a color black to be a jet deep black they had to create a man-made synthetic color that replicated what the human eye saw as black the truth of the matter is that in nature there is very little evidence of actual true black colors if you were to go grab yourself a bumblebee and put them under a a magnifying glass you would see that those black stripes are not really jet black they're dark sure but they're not really jet black um, and so a fake black a man-made black had to be synthesized for this color model 
So again, it's a subtractive color model. It's used in color printing. It's also used to describe the printing process itself, meaning when a four color press, and if you've never seen a four color press that prints like thousands of textbooks or thousands of posters all at once, you know, those sorts of printing presses, they're huge. They take up entire rooms. Um, when a printing press is printing all the colors needed to create a full color experience, it literally prints the inks or the dyes in the order that they are listed in the color model. So all the cyan colors go down first, all the magenta colors go down next, then yellow, and finally black. Okay? So the color model is not only just the name of it, but it's also the order in which those dyes or inks or whatever are actually printed. And so it varies from print house to print house, from press operator to press operator, but ink is typically applied in that order. Okay. Uh, in the additive color models, such as RGB, white, of course, is that combination of all the colors, and then black, of course, is the absence of light. When you turn off all the lights, you get a dark room, right? And so it works the same way. The same YK model is the opposite of that. Now, you would think that since we still use RGB and CMYK today, that researchers and scientists and artists would just sort of be done trying to figure out color, but they did not. They persisted. And so one of the things that RGB and CMYK do not address is the presence of light. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, if you go to a store and pick out a red t-shirt, right? And if the store you're in has fluorescent lighting inside the store and there are no windows, well, that red t-shirt might look slightly different to you or it looks one way to you. Well, if you then walked outside with the t-shirt, make sure you pay for it first or they'll tackle you. But you take it outside, and let's say it's a nice bright sunny day, you might notice that that red changes a little bit. It looks a little different to you because you're seeing it under a different type of light. Similarly, if you were to look at something, if you were to look at a color in a, in a dark room, and I don't mean pitch black, but in a, in a shaded room, as opposed to a well-lit room, it would also look different. So the existence of light and shadow plays a big role in how color is perceived by the human eye. And so the RGB and CMYK color models did not address that. They didn't bring that up. They basically were working with what you call pure color with no worries about the light. And so later on in the 20th century, uh, this color system, the Munsell color system, was developed by Professor Albert Munsell. He named it after himself, which is a little bit egotistical, but that's okay. The man really liked color. So the Munsell color system dealt with hue, value, and chroma. Now, those words might not be familiar to you, but basically those three color dimensions uh, break down like this. Hue is essentially which color is it. So if you imagine the color wheel, you know, that color wheel that you learned in kindergarten too, that looks like a rainbow in the shape of a circle. Um, so that color wheel is referenced as hue. Any color you pick from the color wheel is the hue. Then there is value. Value refers to how much light is being applied to that color or not being applied to that color. And then the last value is chroma, which is how pure that color is based on the amount of light that is, that is being uh, projected onto it or through it, right? Um, now, that might sound a little confusing, but you can see a model of the Munsell color system over here on the right, and you can see that the, uh, the hula hoop around the middle represents the color wheel or a hue, so you can pick out all the different colors from there. And then you can adjust the value or the amount of light by sliding that hula hoop up and down on this pole in the middle, right? More light as you go higher, less light as you go lower, and therefore it gets darker. And then once you settle on the amount of light or the value, then you can adjust the chroma based on how pure the color is, and that sort of comes out from the pole uh, horizontally. And you can see that the color becomes more and more pure the further away you get from the light. And so the Munsell system, it's more complex than RGB or CMYK, but it does a more accurate job of talking about how we view color. So it's not just about how your eyeball and your brain functions, like RGB, and it's not just how we print things, like CMYK. It also has a lot to do with the amount of light that is, that is involved in the process. Okay, also in the 20th century came the Pantone matching system. Now, what's interesting about the Pantone matching system is that this was not an attempt to further explain how humans interact with color. This was not a scientific or an academic or an artistic endeavor trying to figure out color. This was a company trying to make money off the world of color, to which you're probably thinking, 
somebody tried to monetize color. And yes, somebody successfully monetized color. So the Pantone matching system, unfortunately referred to as the PMS system, is largely a standardized color reproduction system. Uh, the goal by the Pantone company, which was a Canadian company, was to standardize colors that were used in print shops. Now, I just said that CMYK is used in printing, but here was the drawback in printing with CMYK. Is sure you needed cyan ink and magenta ink and yellow ink and black ink to go ahead and do your printing, but what if a print shop in Canada bought their inks from one manufacturer and then a print shop in Germany bought their inks from a different manufacturer and what if a print shop in Florida bought their inks from a third manufacturer and what if you were like a rock and roll band that was traveling around the world and you wanted to have your concert shirts at every location you were touring right well you're not going to drag thousands of t-shirts around with you instead you're going to have local print shops print up your t-shirts for you and they'll be available when you arrive at the city that you're playing at right and so the print shop in Canada they get the graphics for your t-shirt and they print up a bunch of t-shirts using their inks and then that print shop in Germany does the same thing and a print shop in Florida does the same thing. And you, the leader of the band or the band manager, you get there and you notice, gee, the t-shirts look a little different from city to city, right? It's the same design, obviously, and the colors are close, but they're a little bit off. Well, that doesn't make sense. They're using the same formula, right? The same percentages to make the different colors, and yet they look a little different. And it's not because the CMYK formula is flawed. It's because the original inks that they were using come from different locations and therefore have different properties. So that presented a bit of a problem. And so the Pantone company realized this, and they thought they could make money on this by coming up with a series of colors that could be uniformly manufactured that would replicate exactly the same way from place to place to place to place so when every time something was printed out it would be consistent and the goal was to create a series of colors that could not be replicated using CMYK so Pantone had a scientist who worked for them Lawrence Herbert and he was tasked with developing this color system and he developed the majority of the Pantone system on his own with his team of scientists and color theorists and he ended up designing 1114 spot colors for the Pantone company that cannot be simulated or replicated using the CMYK system. He came up with 13 base pigments including white and black, so 15 total, so 13 colors plus white and black, and then if you mixed those 15 colors together in a variety of different percentages like a recipe, you would get all 1114 spot colors from Pantone. Pantone then went ahead and manufactured these colors as inks, as dyes, as paints, as all sorts of physical color media, and then they sold them to print shops all over the world with the promise that whatever you were printing would be consistent from place to place to place. Well, if you think about the number of things that are printed worldwide, from books to posters to flyers to t-shirts to all sorts of things, that level of consistency was attractive to the manufacturers of clothing all the way down to that rock and roll band who wants their t-shirts looking the same and so in this way Pantone monetized the world of color and for a very long time for many years they did a pretty amazing job of having a stranglehold or a monopoly on the world of color and so uh, this here is an example of the Pantone matching system chart these little flip booklets were sent out to all designers, all print shops, all artists, anybody who would need access to printing technology, where you could see all 1,114 colors. Each one was assigned a code, a Pantone code. And then you could simply order the inks or the dyes or the paints, or you could, or you could reference those colors in your designs and then send them out to the print shops. And you could be guaranteed that your band t-shirts or whatever you were printing looked exactly the same from place to place. So Pantone was successful in making a lot of money on monetizing color. Okay, so let's move down. Now, that's not to say that there have not been other color models over time. In the 20th century, there definitely were some others. Here are some models right here you can look at. They're all very attractive to look at. So there's the LAB system, the HSV system, HSL, and NCS. These are all acronyms, of course. 
uh, that stand for different things relating to light, photography, color, etc. Uh, there's actually an interactive fun model you can play with at this link of the HSL system, so certainly check that out. Now, so again, it's not as if other scientists and researchers have not come up with other color models, but none of these have become as popular or have, are not as widely in use as the previous bunch. Uh, these days, like I say, everything is either RGB, SAMYK, uses the Munsell system, even uses the RYB system, back to our kindergarten children, and yes, people still use the Pantone system for printing purposes. Pantone is still in business doing what they do in the world of printing. These other color models, while they are academically and artistically interesting, are just not widely used, but they're still fun to look at, right? Okay, the next part of this, of course, is about learning about color. I mentioned this at the beginning of the talk, is that there's thousands of books out there on color theory. Um, and so you can certainly learn way more about this as you go through it. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, I put a couple of links here that can give you a little bit of further information about color theory. Okay, so now that we sort of understand where color models came from and the history of color theories, let's talk about the application of color in the world of visual design. And then we'll get to sort of how we do it in Photoshop because all this color theory is fabulous, but it's only useful if we're actually applying it to something. So, like I said, we're going to focus just on CMYK and RGB, and these are primarily used both for screen versions of color, computer screens, websites, television, uh, and printed version of color, flyers, posters, clothing, etc. So now, what if you're a designer, and you're designing something for a client, and they want something to be both printed and on the screen? So that means you have to design in both CMYK and RGB. So let's take a look at this example here. So this graphic of an apple here was drawn in Adobe Illustrator, right, which we'll get to soon. And it, let's pretend that this is a graphic that a client wanted created to be used for a poster design or on a postcard or something printed, right? So they hire a graphic designer, they design this graphic. Since they know it's going to be printed, they would design it using the CMYK color model, right? And so this is what the graphic looks like. So it goes to the client, the client looks at it, says, hey, this is wonderful, this is great, go ahead and print it on my flyers, my posters, my t-shirts, whatever you want to print it on. Okay, great. So they print it. A short time later, the client calls the designer back and says, hey, we're building a website for our Apple event here, and uh, we need you to uh, send us a version of this graphic that we can give to our web designer to put on the website. Can you convert it over to RGB? Because, of course, that color model is what we use in web design. And the designer says, sure, no problem. They open up their Adobe Illustrator file. They convert the color model from CMYK to RGB, and they send it off to the client. The client receives this version on the right. Looks different, right? The client calls up. He's mad. He's angry. What did you do to my Apple? Why does it not look the same? What did you do? Why did you make changes? And the designer says, I didn't do anything. All I did was change the color model. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, here's the problem with RGB and CMYK is that even though the CMYK color model can make up to like millions of colors, 16 million colors approximately, and the RGB color model can also make approximately 16 million colors. The truth is that they do not make exactly the same colors. They make a lot of the same colors, but there are a good number of colors that can be made in CMYK that cannot be replicated in RGB and vice versa. And so, when you are converting your graphic from print-ready color model to screen-ready color model, you might notice a conversion in color. Because what your program will do, whether it's Adobe Illustrator or Adobe Photoshop or whatever, is it will just pick the closest color to the one that was in existence in the old color model. And that's what happened here. Now, to be fair, I designed this graphic purposely to use colors that I know don't translate between the two color models. The odds of this happening to you are pretty slim, but it could certainly happen with one color or two colors maybe. So you have to be careful when you're converting your graphics from print ready to screen ready or back and forth that the colors convert properly. Now, of course, none of these colors. We have two greens, two reds, two more greens here. And you'll notice that none of those, all six of those colors, do not translate back and forth. So while color theory and color application has come a long way, it is still not entirely foolproof. There are potholes that we have to look out for. 
Now, speaking of web colors, we had technological problems at the beginning of the World Wide Web, right? When web design first became a thing in sort of the late 1990s, early 2000s, when web technology sort of caught up with our ability to design things to a certain degree, computer technology wasn't quite there. And so the problem was that the computers at the time that were being sold could not visually display all of the colors that the RGB color palette had to offer. The technology just wasn't there. Video cards didn't work the way they do today. Monitors were not as progressed as they are today. They just weren't as well done. You know, it was, the technology gets better as time goes on. And so early web design was limited in the number of colors it could use. And so trying to figure out which colors you could use using the RGB model was difficult. And so a new color model that was specific to web design came into being, and that's called the hexadecimal system. And this here and this handout, and I'm not going to read through this whole thing, you guys can read through it, but the hexadecimal system was a color model that allowed web designers to choose colors that were guaranteed to display properly on monitors uh, in their web design. Now, how many colors were available consistently on computers at the time in the late 90s, early 2000s? So, you know, not 16 million that you could make using CMYK or, R or RGB. Instead, it was 256 colors. That's quite a reduction in colors, right? From 16 million to 256, that really limits the number of colors you can use. And the truth of the matter is that it was really only 240 colors that could be accurately displayed between Windows computers and Apple computers. They only shared 240 colors between the two operating systems at the time. There were uh, 16 additional colors uh, that were germane to only Windows computers or only Macintosh computers. So not only as a web designer were you limited to a small palette, but you had to be careful that you weren't designing with Mac-only colors or Windows-only colors. So it was really restrictive. So the hexadecimal system is a series of six uh, two-digit combinations. So 00336699CC and FF and they cut across the RGB spectrum. So it still uses RGB, but it breaks it down into less of a rainbow spectrum and more of a grid spectrum. And so therefore it allows you to do combinations that add up to 256. And so uh, aside from the sort of formula bars here, the easiest way to look at it uh, is, we're gonna skip past this here. This goes into color models we've already talked about. But this here is the actual web safe colors that could be made from the hexadecimal system. And as you can see, there's only 256 of them. And you can see not only the hexadecimal code for each one at the top, right? But you can see the RGB formula for each one here. And so web design colors became a way to solve a problem of the technology that really didn't exist in computers at the time. Now, just a little fun history, our friends back in Pantone, right? We talked about the Pantone system down here, right? Uh, they did such a nice job monetizing print colors that when the web came around, you would have thought that Pantone would have jumped on the World Wide Web and started coming up with color systems for web design that they also could have monetized, right? Well, the problem is the people who ran Pantone at the time were presented with the idea by people who worked for them. And they were of the opinion that the World Wide Web would not last, that it was just a fad, and that people would not be using the web for a very long time. And so they didn't bother developing web colors. They just stuck with their print colors. Unfortunately, they were terribly wrong. So it took them until 2001 to actually start providing translations of their print colors into screen colors for the web. So they were a little behind the eight ball because the hexadecimal system came into being in the mid 90s or so. Uh, and so they sort of missed the boat on that one. So the hexadecimal system came into being and the people who came up with the hexadecimal system did not monetize it. They gave away the system for free. Uh, and so the hexadecimal system was used for many years uh, for web design. Now, within Photoshop, go over to Photoshop here, Say hello to Dave and his bird. This is Dave and his bird. You're going to see Dave and his bird again later on in the week. Uh, over here in Photoshop, we access what's called the color picker. Now, don't worry about how I just got that. We're going to look at that in person later. 
But you'll see here that in the color picker, we can access a variety of color models. Uh, you can read through and see them. There's CMYK, there's RGB, there's hexadecimal, there's all the web safe colors, right? And there's even the HSB model and the LAB model, and there's even color libraries that you can access, including the Pantone system. This is their digital translation. So we're going to dive into the color picker and all the different color tools and models in Photoshop next time I see you. All right. So in the meantime, go through those handouts about color, watch that video. And if you want to stop playing around with color in Photoshop, please do so. All right. I will see you soon.